Hello everyone, my name is Brant Kudrowski and this Organic Chemistry Lab video covers a separation of anison components experiment. This is part six, isolating caffeine and melting point analysis. The solution in this separatory funnel contains caffeine dissolved in ethyl acetate. It may also contain a little bit of water, so I'm gonna wash this solution with saturated aqueous sodium chloride solution, or brine. Water has a density of one gram per milliliter and ethyl acetate has a density of 0.9 grams per milliliter. They're very close. This sometimes makes it difficult for water droplets to separate out of ethyl acetate. Brine is more dense than water. Its density is 1.2 grams per milliliter. By adding brine and shaking, I'll make any suspended water droplets much more dense and much more likely to settle out into the water layer and get drained off. This is a method for clarifying organic layers. Here's a close-up of the separatory funnel so you can see the phase boundary between the two liquids. The lower phase is the brine phase, and I'm draining that off into a waste container below. The upper layer is the clarified ethyl acetate layer that contains caffeine. Now I'm pouring the organic layer out the top of the separatory funnel into a clean, dry Erlenmeyer flask. It's better to pour the top layer out the top than to drain it out the bottom because the stopcock contains a little bit of water layer. You'll get a little bit of the aqueous layer, the brine layer, in your solution if you drain it out the bottom. Now I'm weighing out some magnesium sulfate, which is going to act as a drying agent. Magnesium sulfate has an affinity for water, and when we add it to the solution of ethyl acetate, it'll absorb any dissolved water that's in that solution. This is important because water causes problems later. I'm weighing out approximately 2 grams here. You don't have to get 2 grams exactly. If you get close, that's good enough. Now I'm adding the magnesium sulfate to the ethyl acetate solution with caffeine, and I'm giving it a swirl. You'll know you've added enough magnesium sulfate if some of it remains free flowing when you swirl it. Magnesium sulfate should get swirled up when you agitate it, but then settle out. If it's all clumpy, you need to add some more magnesium sulfate. Here I'm pre-weighing a clean, dry 150 milliliter beaker. I'll use this mass later to get the mass of the caffeine sample by difference. Here's my dried solution of caffeine and ethyl acetate with magnesium sulfate in the bottom. I'm going to separate this magnesium sulfate out now using a gravity filtration technique. This type of filtration was described in a previous video. Now I can remove and discard the filter paper with the magnesium sulfate, and I'll add a wooden stick to help smooth out the boiling in the next step. The next step is to evaporate the ethyl acetate and isolate solid caffeine. I'll do that by boiling it in a sand bath in the fume hood. The stick functions as a porous surface for bubbles to form on. It helps smooth out the boiling and keeps the solution from becoming superheated and bumping. It functions in the same way as a boiling chip, if you've ever used one of those. It's just a lot easier to remove a stick at the end. When I remove the stick, you can see the bubbling stops, and then when I put the stick back in, it resumes. Here I'm blowing a gentle stream of air into the flask to accelerate the evaporation process. This will make the evaporation go a little faster. Just make sure that you don't blow air so fast that you blow the solution out of the beaker. Now I'm at the end of the evaporation process and you can see the last bits of ethyl acetate evaporating and leaving behind a white residue of caffeine. It's important at this point not to overheat the solid. Take it out of the sand bath as soon as the solvent disappears. The boiling point of ethyl acetate is 77 degrees C, and as long as there's ethyl acetate present, it'll always be at 77. But as soon as the last bit of ethyl acetate disappears, the temperature goes up really fast. To avoid charring the product, take it off as soon as the ethyl acetate evaporates. Now I'm getting the mass of the beaker with the caffeine in it. I know the mass of this empty beaker from before, so by difference I can get the mass of the caffeine. Here I have the three solids that were isolated in this experiment, the binder, aspirin, and caffeine. I'll be taking melting points of the aspirin and caffeine samples to characterize them. To do that, I'll be putting a sample of each in one of these microcapillary melting point tubes. This is a tube that's open at one end and closed at the other. I'll load caffeine into this tube by taking the open end and jamming it into the solid in the beaker. This will force a little bit of solid into the tube, and then I can turn it right side up and bounce it on the bench to try to force the solid down into the closed end of the tube. If you have trouble getting the solid to go down into the tip of the melting point capillary, try bouncing it through a tube. One option is to use your condenser, which is a tube that's about a foot long. Take the condenser, stand it right side up, drop your melting point tube through it onto the bench, 
and as it bounces, that bouncing action will help pack the sample into the bottom of the capillary. We also have a longer glass tube in the lab that you can use for bouncing melting point tubes that are really stubborn. The longer the drop, the more packing efficiency you get. You don't need much sample in a melting point tube. Usually a sample height of one to two millimeters is fine. You just have to be able to see it. This sample looks good. Next, I'll prepare a melting point sample of aspirin. But since aspirin is crystalline, it won't pack into the tube very well as crystals. So I'll take some of the crystals and grind them into a powder. Then I'll pack that powder into the tube the same way I did for the caffeine sample. Now I need to seal the top of the caffeine tube by heating it in a Bunsen burner flame until it closes up. I only need to do this with the caffeine tube, and that's because caffeine sublimes when it's heated. I'm holding the open end of the caffeine tube just inside the Bunsen burner flame to get it orange hot, and rotating it. As it gets hot, the walls will get soft and they'll close up on themselves, sealing the tube. You can tell that it's sealed if you see a bubble form in the top of the tube like this. This is a melt temp apparatus. This is the machine we'll be using to do our melting point analysis. It has an on off toggle switch and a dial that controls the rate of temperature increase. There's a viewport with a magnifying glass to allow you to see the samples as they're melting. And then there's the slot for the samples themselves, which is just above the viewport. I'll zoom in on the sample loading slot so you can see it more closely. It's possible to fit three melting point tubes in at once. We're just gonna do two today, the caffeine sample and the aspirin sample. Now I'll pan up here so you can see the thermometer. During the melting point analysis, we'll have to keep track of the temperature on the thermometer and the melting samples viewed through the viewport. Now the samples are loaded and I'll get the melting process started by turning on the toggle switch and turning the dial to about 40 volts out of 120. This will get the apparatus heating up. The dial setting affects the rate of temperature increase in the apparatus. 40 volts is a good place to start, but eventually we'll have to turn that up to get the apparatus to go hotter. Now I'll zoom in and show you what it looks like inside the viewport. Melting point is a physical property of solids that can be used to identify them by comparison of the melting points to known values. The melting points of pure caffeine and pure aspirin are well known and reported in the literature. You should look these values up before you start the melting point process so you know about where to expect them. The purity of a solid substance has a big impact on its melting point. Impure solids melt lower. They have depressed melting points. Their range of melting may also be more broad. A melting point is defined as a range between the temperature where you see the first drop of liquid and the temperature at which the last bit of solid disappears and it's all liquid. Record that range. Pure compounds usually have sharp ranges, less than about 4 degrees Celsius. Impure compounds usually have broadened ranges. These can be 5, 10, 20 degrees Celsius or more. It's possible for an impure compound to have a sharp melting point range, but it's not common. It's important that the temperature be rising slowly as you approach the melting point, ideally between 1 and 2 degrees Celsius per minute. If your rate of increase is much faster than that, there's a chance the thermometer won't be able to keep up and you'll read an artificially low melting point. Time has been sped up dramatically in these videos to make them easier to watch, but in reality, when you actually do a melting point, it should be done slowly. Now that aspirin is done melting, I'll turn up the temperature on the melt temp to get the caffeine to melt. This is sped up even more so you can see the process in a reasonable amount of time on this video. The caffeine melts over a very wide range, but remember, we purified the aspirin by recrystallization and the caffeine we did nothing with. This is the end of the Anison Component Separation video series. For related videos, check out my online organic chemistry experiments playlist. 
If you found this video useful, check out the next one in the series or watch the prior video, and consider subscribing to my YouTube channel. My name is Brant Kudrowski. Thanks for watching.